Okay, there we go. Um, John has no idea what I'm going to speak about this morning. Uh, we haven't talked about it. He's got no idea. And yet, uh, I don't think he could have prepared anything better that fit in uh, to what I'm going to talk about. Um, that's always, to me, such a special uh, confirmation that we're, we're on the right road. Um, I'm on James, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. And I'm not going to take it verse by verse, but I'm going to read it to begin with, and then I'm just going to uh, apply the verses as I go on. Uh, this is what it says. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploit is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We judge by what we see. So does God, but only God sees the heart. And as we continue our study in James, we've looked at trials and testings and troubles that God wants to bring us through, storms to bring us through. We talked about temptations and anger, uh, and today we're talking about how we see and treat other people. James really wants us to think about how we treat them, and in particular, how a person's social, economical, ideological status might affect us and how we see them and how we respond to them. Before we delve deeper into this, I want us to see, however, that we all make judgments. We all do. We might say, no, I'm not a judgmental person. We all make judgments. And the Bible says it makes no difference to God today whether you are young or old, whether you're highly educated or you're not, whether you're famous or you're unknown, whether you're black or white, or for that matter, pink and purple polka dotted. He doesn't care what political party you're with. He doesn't care what religious denomination you're from. He wants you to know him, and he wants you to come and experience his love. God doesn't love you more or less according to the color of your skin or the clothes on your body. He doesn't judge like that. We do. He doesn't. He's not impressed by the cars we drive, the fashions that we wear, or that you have more degrees than a thermometer. It makes no difference. The Second Chronicles 19.7 says that with the Lord our God, there is no injustice or partiality. That word partiality means favoritism. That's what James said. 
treating people differently in an unfair way. Of course, people are different. But isn't that the genius of God's creativity, that nobody's the same, that we're diverse? Isn't that what makes a beautiful bouquet? The Lord deals with us as individuals, much like a good parent who loves their children all the same, but treats them all a little bit differently because he understands their differences. Deuteronomy 10, 17 says, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality. The old King James Version, it translates this as God is no respecter of persons. Of course, that doesn't mean he doesn't respect us. He, he will give us the right and privilege to refuse to choose his love that he offers us freely. He won't force it on us, the gentleman. Some new versions say that God doesn't play favorites. The prophet Samuel, when was told that when he was looking for somebody who God could and would use, God said to Samuel, people judge by outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. First Samuel 16, 7, it says that Samuel found, or rather God found the one nobody that nobody else would have chosen. David was the youngest. In the eyes of his brother, maybe even his daddy was the runt of the litter. And God said to Samuel, here's a man after my own heart. He's going to be king of Israel. Nobody could have predicted that. As you read through the Bible, have you ever noticed how time after time God picks other people that we would judge as unworthy? In fact, I'll bet that they themselves would probably have ruled themselves out. We might look into the mirror and not like what we see. But remember, James told us that in the last chapter, he said that the word of God is the most trustworthy mirror that we can look into because his word, his word sees who you are at the heart. His word allows us to, 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 to dwell into our inner being that we might like not like to not like to to delve into we judge by what we see and so does god but god sees our heart what is favoritism james 2 1 he says my brothers and sisters believers in our glorious lord jesus christ must not show favoritism the root of favoritism it, it means to lift up somebody's face to elevate them lift up somebody's face. I'm looking at this saying, I think I need a facelift. <laughs> the idea is to judge somebody and take them at face value. Okay? A superficial evaluation of a person's worth based on nothing but what appears on the outside, the surface. So James is telling us here that showing favoritism, judging on the outside appearances, is absolutely incompatible with being a Christian. In verse 9, he says, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. If you do that, you break God's law. Let that sink in. That's pretty potent. That's pretty strong stuff. Now, let's remember who James was. Jesus' half-brother. He grew up with this older brother that he would call Yeshua, an ordinary name like my Joshua, and James' name would have been Yaakov, and then there was Jude, and there were some other brothers and a sister that's unnamed, an ordinary family, if you're judging by appearances. We don't know the birth order for sure. We know that Jesus was first, obviously. But it's pretty clear that Jesus knew he was something special. It's pretty clear that Mary knew he was something special. I mean, after all, she had the angel Gabriel come and tell her. And Joseph knew 
about the special virgin birth. He knew Jesus was special. They had these visitors come and bring gifts for the king when he was a little baby in a manger. They had to escape at night to go to Egypt. And then as Jesus grew, Mary and Joseph had other children together. And this must have been tough for James growing up. I mean, how do you deal with a perfect brother, a perfect older brother? He sets the bar, especially when Jesus begins to leave home and he starts preaching and healing and doing these miracles and he, and he gets into trouble for it. I mean, James, James literally thought Jesus was going crazy. In fact, his whole family did. At one point, they tried to come and get him. But if you want to prove you really are God, <laughs> dying then rising again, that would probably do it, right? <laughs> Now, James has come to see that this Jesus, his brother, died and rose again and appeared to him. He stopped calling him my brother. And he realized all along he was my Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. God came to live with us. The word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood, as Eugene Peterson in the message says. Now, when we get that, whatever growing up was like and whatever the, the, the word family means to you, it really helps you not feel inferior or superior to anyone else. You're just amazingly blessed. Because the most important person in the universe, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, doesn't just want to be your friend and my friend. He wants to be family with us forever. The most important VIP in the universe has come to meet you and I, to find us, to love us, and to invite us into his family forever. So James says, brothers and sisters, don't play favorites. Now, the outworking of that inward realization is that we shouldn't go around judging by externals. After all, this, this person we're judging may end up being our brother and sister forever. And isn't it weird that James specifically says this should not happen in our meetings. Some other translations, it says gatherings. The word means synagogue. Essentially, it means church. So he's writing to the early Jewish believers in Jesus before the opposition became too fierce and they ended up being scattered saints, kind of like what we are now with this COVID virus days. And he's addressing them. And he said, this especially shouldn't happen in your meeting. So obviously it was. It was reflected even more in the temple with various courts and signs uh, delineating who was allowed according to their race or, or sex. But in the synagogues, woman, women sat on one side and men on the other. And there was a curtain that divided them. There were seats of honor. And you were graded. In important, they were graded in importance, so people are sorted according to their, their rank and status in society. That's, that's how it worked. Now imagine, James says, some real rich guy or girl, you know what, from experience, let's just say a celebrity drives into the church's driveway for a Bible study that she heard about. I'm thinking 1986 in New Jersey, when my college and career group was in full swing and we were getting 50 to 60 people on a Tuesday night for Bible study, people in their 20s and 30s coming out regularly. So I was a 26-year-old single guy who got plugged into this because God saw fit to choose somebody unworthy like me. And he called me to ministry. 
And so as I'm sitting there getting ready for the Bible study, she walks in. Besides being gorgeous, she was a bit of a celebrity and available. She comes with all the pomp, all the glamour, the leather pants, the very stylish shirt, lots of showy jewelry. She was just a knockout. Now, what do, what do you do with her? Everybody knows this, notices her. I mean, what's not to notice? She sticks out. Do you roll out the red carpet? Do you treat her differently? No. Do you treat them as you do anyone who comes rich or poor, celebrity or non-celebrity? Yes. You welcome them. You love them. You tell them that, that King Jesus became poor for their sake when they came to die, when he came to die for our sins and that he's now alive and wants to be their best friend. You treat them the very, the very best you can so that they know that God loves them. The outside doesn't matter. However successful they might look, however prosperous in this life, they need the Lord to live in their hearts, to change them from the inside out. So B was a beauty with all the pizzazz, a New York City model and looked perfectly the part. In the synagogues of, Jewish, of Jesus's time, there'd be a few seats and benches to sit on. Most people sat cross-legged on the floor, unless you were a little up in status. That wasn't the case in my day. We had lots of seats for everyone. We had couches. But what if I'd been so bedazzled by this newcomer that I made sure she had the best seat in the house? And let's just say I was going to give her a seat where she would have happened to sit close by Kenny. Now, that never happened. I'm just using an example. Let me give you a background. And Ken, Kenny was really poor, <clears throat> homeless, in fact. He had a host of other severe issues. And say he got up and went to the bathroom and I gave his seat away so that she didn't have to sit near him. And Kenny comes back, and Kenny sees that his seat was taken, and Kenny just sits on the floor. Now, that's exactly what Kenny would have done. He was one of the gentlest souls I have ever met. But it always seemed like Kenny had one set of clothes, and by his smell, he probably lived and slept in, in them, and I remember on one occasion when I would take him out for dinner after Bible study, he would always take his napkin and save half his meal and put it into the napkin and, and take it home with him. At first, I didn't say anything to him. I thought he was keeping it for a snack later on, couldn't finish his meal. And then one day I, I, I asked him, and, and by the way, he lived on the corner of Route 4 and Route 17 in New Jersey in the woods, little lean two that he built unless he had someone's garage to sleep in, but he didn't like to do that because he didn't like to put people out. He was homeless. I asked him, Kenny, why do you take half your meal and put it in? He goes, that's her Roxy. Roxy was his dog. And he always took care of her and he always made sure that when he ate, she ate. And he brought it back for her and Kenny had it rough. At 13, he came home to find his dad hung himself in the living room. And from that point on, he went into drugs and eventually went homeless. Kenny died one day in the woods with Roxy protecting his body until the police, the police came and, and would capture her and put her up for adoption. But I believe in my heart that Kenny knew Jesus. And he didn't hesitate to talk about him. I believe he is my brother. And I believe I'll see him again. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving the new girl a good seat, literally an elevated seat, as long as you do the same for the poor guy, too. But if I don't, judging by appearances, making a prejudgment about them, I've become prejudiced. 
I've become what verse four describes as a judge with evil thoughts. That word evil here can translate as vicious, judging that the well-off are better than the poor. And just so you know, the ending to the story, B became a sold-out Christian, married a pastor, lives down south. Kenny passed away, but he affected so many people with his gentle spirit and soft heart. James says that now we are one family. In verse 5, it says, listen, dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are, are they not the ones that are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blasting the noble name of him to whom you belong? We live in a, in a world where a handful of men own probably more than the poorest half of humanity. I, I don't know how those wealthy men spend their money. James says that how we use our money demonstrates whether or not we bear a family resemblance. Basically, what he's saying is, which kingdom means more to you, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world? And, and I want to stress how we use our money, not how we spend our money. There's a difference. God is given so that we can use. He doesn't give so that we can just spend on our wants. That's, and I want you to understand, I'm not saying it's wrong to be wealthy or rich. Absolutely not. God gives, God takes away. The more you have, the more good you can choose to do with what you have. But the Bible says that Jesus, though he was rich, for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Rich in ways that matter most and that last forever. He spent his time not in palaces, not with the influential people, but in places of poverty, with those who had little common folk. I read uh, a couple weeks ago about, uh, it, because of this coronavirus, that the world is facing a bigger hunger emergency than ever before in history, which could double the number of people facing uh, acute hunger to 265 million by the end of the year. Nairobi, Kenya, where my niece Dana, her husband Wes, and their new uh, little baby girl lives, recently had uh, flour and cooking oil arrive. And when it arrived, there were so many people there clamoring for it that a, a huge amount of people were injured, were crushed by the, by the crowds. Some people were killed because of the crush of people. Can you imagine that 135 million people around the world were already on the verge of starving and facing uh, acute food sort, uh, shortages, and now the pandemic has hit? So they're saying 130 million more could go hungry, hungry, hungry by 2021. That's a, not a good picture. And our, our, our first response is either fear or generosity. I have been so overwhelmed by our church, Tekana Christian Church, and how we have always chosen to be generous. We want to help those who are struggling, and we have. And I think we've been blessed so we can be a blessing. Proverbs 28, 27 says, He that gives to the poor shall not lack, but he that hides his eyes shall have many a curse. There's a promise for the generous. You can give and give and give, and God will replenish. He will give it back. He'll put it right back. And that's not saying that that's why we give. We give out of the goodness of our heart. 
because God has blessed us, so we pass that blessing along. And when God sees that, he says, I can bless you because you're going to bless others with what I've given. There was an old farmer who was always giving money away, crazy amounts, but yet he never seemed to lack. And so he was asked how it worked, and the farmer said, God keeps filling my barn. I go in there and throw it out, but he just keeps throwing it in. His shovel is bigger than my pitchfork. What's your favorite prejudice? Maybe you're someone with less and you judge people with more and you make assumptions about them because they have. You do realize that it's as sinful to judge a rich person as it is to judge someone who's poor. Or, or we may not pick according to another prejudice. What are, what are the, the, our preferences? Our prejudice preferences. Is it that somebody belongs to a rival political party? The color of their skin? A different lifestyle than the one we live? And no, we're not talking about a lifestyle that the Bible has specifically defined as wrong. You know, when I was engaged to my wife, I had a guy come to me. He, I was the pastor, and he came to me, and he told me, that it was wrong for me to marry Margaret. She wore too much jewelry and too many rings, not a pastor's wife. He judged her based on what she wore. And I knew that she just liked them. She wasn't trying to show off or display a certain style. She just liked them. And personally, I thought she wore them pretty well. In some churches, People are given positions of leadership because they have a great voice. They're given maybe a place of prominence because of their evident musical gifts or, or maybe their upfront skills. But really, what about their character? What if they're prideful or gossiping or divisive? And here's the problem. It's hard not to be dazzled by externals. And all too often, it takes time for character to be revealed. The way you change your mind is to challenge your stereotypes and break your prejudices. We do that by looking at how Christ treated people, all people, and imitate him. You meet people who are different, and then you discover that they're people. You discover what's at the heart of this exterior. You find out who they are on the inside, and surprisingly, they become your friend. God loves to paint using every color and shade. It's never just black and white. He loves people, all people. That's who he died for. So in conclusion, James is saying to us here that discriminating against another person who God made and loves breaks his heart heart. And it breaks his royal law. James said, verse 8, if you, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, if you sin and are convicted by the law, you are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. In chapter 1, James showed us that God's law, his word is like a mirror. And here he says, if you break the mirror in one place, you break the whole thing. I mean, isn't that the way it is? You smash a mirror in one place, you throw it out. This is why we need grace. That's why we all need the Lord. That's why we need to carefully evaluate how we look at others, how we see others. As people God loves or as people against us, especially as we go through the political climate that we're living in right now. Even though every one of us has at times made snap decisions and, and faulty assumptions, 
because of our favorite prejudice, whatever that might be. You know, sometimes we say, oh, you know what? It, it, I said that, but it was just a joke. It, it, it's just a joke. It's just the way I was brought up. And we kind of excuse our thinking. If God was taking that test, here's what would happen no matter what face. And I want you to get this in your head. If God's taking this test where faces come up, and no matter what face appears on the screen, the word that God would use automatically that he would push to assign to that face, no matter what the race or the gender, rich or poor, Democrat or Republican, the only thing that he would say is, I love them. I love them. John talked before about John 3, 16 and 1 John 16, and he emphasized love. Love, love, love. And that's, that's the bottom line here. It includes me and you. Thank God we are loved. No matter how many times... No matter how many ways I've been wrong, that I've done wrong, he says to me, Dave, I love you. I forgive you. I love you. And I want you in my family. Why me? And by the way, the person you may be holding a bit of prejudice against for whatever reason and I prefer the word prejudice rather than racism. Racism is about color. Prejudice is about difference. And it is so prevalent in our society, always has been, always will be, because we're humans. But there are certain truths that we as believers need to hold on to. Number one, that God is God and we are not. Number two, that his truth, his word is truth, and it is our absolute absolute authority, period. And number three, that he loves all men and women, no matter what, all. Because you see, that's why he went to the cross, to die for the world, to die for everyone, not just you and me. And he left us a symbol. So that every time we looked at it, we could remember, he loves me. I'm family. All of us who claim him as Lord and Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're family. doesn't matter what we look like. We're going to be with each other forever. And that's the cross. And right now, as we prepare for our time of communion, I just want you to pray and talk to God and find out if there's any prejudiced, wrong assumptions that you've made on people and ask them for forgiveness for that and then move out and start to understand that these people that you might hold something against, James tells us, don't play favorites. Jesus says, I love them all. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was questioned, what's the greatest law in all of the word of God? He says, love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That sums it up. Let's, uh, I think Beth has a, 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 something that she's going to put on there and, and uh, just take some time and think about it before we share communion with each other. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that we would remember the bottom line is that you're all about loving us. And Lord, I pray that you would instill in our hearts and our minds a love for those that are our neighbors. Deliver us from prejudice. In Jesus' name, amen.